Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody who is uh, joining us through the streaming. Uh, welcome at the second webinar of our the Marie Curie Alumni Association Euroscientist 2017 webinar series. Um, the title of this webinar, as you already know, is Making Science Count in Policymaking. My name is Michele Catanzaro. I'm a physicist. I'm a freelance science journalist for Nature, El Periodico, and other outlets, and I will be the moderator of this event. As you know, policy is influenced by plenty of different factors, like uh, moral choices, traditions, communication, etc., and all these aspects play a key role in shaping policies. Science is just one ingredient, but certainly if this specific ingredient is ignored, we are almost sure to fail. Um, recently, the European Union has launched its own mechanism to convey scientific advice to policymakers, which comes after a long tradition of uh, models, uh, especially the one of chief scientific advisors uh, pioneered by UK and other countries. Um, webinar is an opportunity to check the state of the art of the European advice mechanism uh, and uh, also to it has also a broader scope uh, the idea is to discuss the different models uh, of scientific advice and in general discuss the situation of scientific advice and scientific expertise with its relations uh, with policy and politics in a time in which, as we all know, post-truth, alternative facts, fake news are something that happens every day. So uh, the panel uh, is maybe the best choice we could make because we have two scientific advisors, uh, one of the European Union and one of Ireland, and a scholar that is expert in this subject. Um, I introduce them shortly. Mark Ferguson, biologist and director general of the Science Foundation of Ireland and chief scientist, scientific advisor of, to the government of Ireland. Per Lickstra, sociologist, member of the high level group of scientists adver advising the cabinet of European commissioners. And Roger Pilke, mathematician and political scientist, author of The Honest Broker, Making Sense of Science in Policy and Politics. So I would like to start with Mark Ferguson for temporal reason, because I understand that his institution of scientific advice is the oldest among the, the two that are represented here. So Mark Ferguson, Director General of the Science Foundation Ireland, the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Government of Ireland since 2012, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the webinar. Maybe just to begin with, I'll give uh, a, a little a scene of uh, how science advice in Ireland works and, and more or less what I do. So on the one hand, I run the major science funding agency in Ireland, which is called Science Foundation Ireland. That's a government funded agency uh, which competitively funds uh, research grants which are made to the uh, foundation in all areas of science. And then I'm also the chief scientific advisor. And previously there were two people uh, doing those two jobs, but as part of the economic austerity measures in Ireland, uh, the two posts were amalgamated and that's fine. That's a part of science's uh, response uh, uh, to uh, economy measures. Uh, and I do not do science policy uh, on my own. Uh, there is a science policy advisory group uh, run by the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, of which I'm a member, but there are about 20 other members. So there's actually no uh, theoretical conflict of interest. I'm not implementing my own policy. So if you look at uh, the uh, chief scientific advisor role, um, how does that play out in Ireland? So there's obviously a, a need in making policy to have independent advice or review of various issues, and those issues are remarkably similar around the world, uh, for example, whether it be CRISPR technology or whether it be cyber security or what have you. So as a small country, Ireland does not produce any of its own reports. We, I rely and the country relies heavily on the independent reports produced by others, for example, the Royal Society, the National Academy of Sciences, the Leopoldo Foundation, the European Union, and so on. 
And if you look at those independent reports on a particular topic, they are remarkably similar. And that's kind of good because they're reviewing uh, the same body of evidence. So we rely heavily on independent reports uh, uh, from others. And of course, then they are contextualized into an Irish context, either by uh, uh, science technical advisors in the various departments or whomever. So, so the formal part of the scientific uh, advice is taken care of in that way. Then there's quite a lot of informal advice, uh, and maybe advice is the wrong word to describe, but informal meetings. So I would meet regularly with government ministers, with the prime minister and so on. And in part, that's about science advocacy. It's about pointing out how science can be helpful. It's about finding out what people's needs are. They may not have thought that science may be uh, helpful uh, uh, for what their needs are. It's partly uh, uh, reminding people about the contribution uh, scientific research may make to whatever domain that they have. And then, of course, a facet of that is also science diplomacy, uh, and that's deployed internationally, uh, either on our international collaborative schemes or, or when we're trying to do something uh, uh, with other countries overseas where science is part of the agenda. So that's sort of like the bulk of what the chief scientific advisor role is. It's about advocacy uh, within government. It's about advocacy internationally. And then uh, a common feature between the two roles is uh, trying to have a more engaged public. And engagement is not the same as education. Uh, so clearly, you know, we run uh, a series of outreach events, uh, science events, which are partly to educate people, but also to engage people to find out what the public would like in terms of uh, scientific research, to find out uh, what their priorities are, to understand people's uh, anxieties and and like many other countries, we've conducted surveys of the Irish public barometer studies to understand the Irish uh, public's attitude to science um, and, and different groups, you know, whether they're educated uh, folks, whether they're white collar, blue collar, rural, uh, city, you know, age, sex, and so on. Uh, and, you know, our ultimate aim is to try and reach people uh, who are less engaged with science, who are typically not people who go to a science fair or to a, a science outreach event. And there, the approach is to use science by stealth, uh, which is really, uh, for example, television programs that have science embedded within them, but they're not like science documentaries. So one of the ones that we um, uh, co-produce, so to speak, not produce is the wrong word, co-fund, um, uh, is called Big Week on the Farm. So in Ireland, it's a rural country. The farming is an important activity. And so you can introduce various scientific concepts in the context of, of a broadcast that's really about uh, the rural community and what they do and, and some you know, wacky things, you know, how many sausages can you eat in a minute or whatever. Um, so, so that's, uh, again, part of the rule. It's not a science advice rule uh, per se, but I think it's dreadfully important if you want to have an engaged public uh, who are going to be able to uh, give a, a view on whatever particular area of science it is, then they need to be engaged. They need to have some uh, level of understanding. They need to be able to debate uh, the issues uh, rationally. So that's sort of what I do. In terms of uh, staffing, uh, there's only me, there's no staff, um, and I'm allowed to use the resources of Science Foundation Ireland uh, to assist with the uh, Chief Scientific Advisor role, uh, but it's not a specific office. Um, now, obviously, there are different science advice mechanisms. You'll hear shortly what's used in the European Union and the national uh, chief scientists uh, in Europe or their equivalent academies and whatnot, network into the European uh, uh, network. And that's very important, it's particularly important for small countries like Ireland. So I probably leave it at that and then uh, answer some questions if they're coming through on the webinar or anything else you'd like me to say. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It was very interesting to hear that you see science communication, let's say, or science uh, um, or the involvement, let's say, of public in science as part of your task. So now let's move to Pearl Dijkstra. Pearl Dijkstra. Uh, she was appointed in 2015 as member of the high-level group of scientists who advised the College of European Commissioners. She has a chair in empirical sociology at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Uh, and her, as a researcher, she has focused on internet generational solidarity, aging society, family change, aging uh, and the life course, and late life well-being. Uh, so 
Mm, Pearl, uh, please uh, go on. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for organizing this webinar. And it's a great opportunity to see, um, to interact with a public, although we cannot see the public, but also to be interacting with Mark Ferguson, with you and with Roger Pielka. Um, the, I'm a member of the high level group. There are seven of us um, covering a range of disciplines, but of course we do not represent all of the academic disciplines. We don't aim to, we are a selection. We represent different countries, east and west, north and south, but we were not elected as country representatives, but we were elected on our own um, expertise and our own background. When I started, I was the only social scientist, but by now we are two social scientists. We do this work part-time. Um, so we still have our, as the Dutch would say, our uh, boots in the mud of actual doing science on a day-to-day -day basis. But all seven of us have extensive expertise in providing advice to policymakers, to stakeholders on the basis of our own research. We are supported by a secretariat, um, around 20 academics um, who work in Brussels at uh, the DG Research. Again, a very wide range of backgrounds. And um, this is quite recent. We are also now being supported by an organization called SAPEA. SAPEA stands for Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. So now we cannot just draw on our own expertise, the expertise of the Secretariat, but we are now being fed by the associations of academies, so the associations of the engineers, the associations of the humanities councils, the associations of medical councils. So it's we represent, or at least we can draw on the knowledge body of you know, top of science all over Europe. And that includes non-EU countries like Norway and like Switzerland. So far, we have worked, um, we have received responded to requests from the Commission. So we've um, produced what we call an opinion, a scientific opinion on cybersecurity. We also produced, but this is called an explanatory note on new breeding techniques. The difference between the two is that an explanatory note is, this is the state of the art of science. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. This is where there's agreement. This is where there's no agreement. Whereas when we talk about the opinions, we, we um, develop recommendations, policy recommendations. And of course, it's up to the commission uh, to see what they want to do with it. We are also developing our own topics. Um, and they are more long range. And there we will be working again with SAPEA. So it's the associations of academies. Our evidence, um, to an extent we rely on reports, to an extent we rely on uh, publications, um, gray publications, but anything that's been published also in through peer review. We, um, work very transparently in the sense that everything we read um, is can be seen on the website. People who read our reports will see what information fed into us, what we did with the previous evidence and what we did not do with it. I think our role, uh, Mark talked about informal advice, formal advice. Our role is of the more formal kind although throughout our it's informal at the start when we develop together with a representatives on the commission what question is it you would like us to address is it a question where we think science can make a difference and this is an engagement that we do at the beginning and towards the end when we have developed our recommendations when we have the report 
we present it to what we call stakeholder workshops. So this will be representatives of citizens groups, representatives of industry, representatives from science, depending on what the topic is, to hear whether um, what we suggest, whether they service they for us as a sounding board not that we will change our ideas but at least then we can see whether we are feel we can be making a difference um that's in a nutshell um the procedures that we follow okay great thanks a lot so as you can see there is really uh, i mean we have seen here uh, two very different models an individual person versus a group different ways in which scientific advice is somehow incepted, either required by politicians or uh, proposed by uh, the advisors themselves, uh, and also different sources, either academies or reports from already existing reports, original reports that are based on, uh, on uh, um, opinion gathered um, through, um, among experts. So uh, the next speaker is not a scientific advisor himself, but is somebody that has thought hard on the subject. Uh, Roger Pilke is the author of the book, The Honest Broker, Making Sense of Science in Policy and Politics. He is the director of the Sports Governance Centers at the Uni Center at the University of Colorado. His research, focus on, uh, his research focuses on science, innovation, and politics, but also on the governance of sports organi organization. He holds degrees in mathematics, public policies, and political science. And I think he will take advantage of the first intervention to give us, let's say, a model or a picture of the different kinds or different possibilities of uh, uh, involvement of scientists in policy. So, Roger, the stage is yours. Thank you. And it's great to be with you. Um, especially with Mark and Pearl, who uh, have very difficult jobs uh, working in the real world of science advice. Um, for, for a long time in my career, I was a social scientist who worked in a natural science organization. And one of the things I came to realize very quickly is that uh, many natural scientists want to engage with uh, decision makers, uh, sometimes with policy makers, which is wonderful. It's great. And many of us social scientists who study the, the interaction of science and, and politics, um, we don't support them as much as we should. We write articles and send it to the scientific literature. Um, so I thought at some point it would be useful to try to um, engage in a little bit of practical communication with uh, experts uh, to give them some advice themselves on engagement with policymakers. Um, and that's how the honest broker um, came to be. And what it really is is a field guide to roles and responsibilities for experts who want to engage with policymakers. Um, the goal isn't to provide answers to everything, but to give us a framework um, that allows a vocabulary for talking about roles and responsibilities. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through the framework, and if people would like to discuss, we can go into a lot more detail. Um, but what I've done is outline basically five different roles that uh, the expert can play when interacting with a decision maker. Um, one of them is, is what I call the peer scientist. Um, most scientists do not engage with policymakers, um, either by choice or by the position they're in. Um, there's a lot of debate of whether there is actually such a thing as a pure scientist who focuses only on science. Uh, but for the point of this discussion, um, if the pure scientist wants to remain out of decision making, then we can set them aside. Um, the second category is, is what I call the science arbiter. The science arbiter is the expert who the decision maker wants to get information from. Um, we heard a little bit about this um, from, from Pearl with the uh, explanatory note. Sometimes policymakers just have questions that can be answered uh, based on the best available evidence. And uh, we put together advisory committees, uh, expert committees. Uh, sometimes there's a single science advisor, but the goal there is there's a structured, usually a structured interaction with uh, a decision maker. And the decision maker asks a question, um, how far can North Korean missiles go? And uh, the set of experts will provide the best evidence with uncertainties and conflicting views and so on. Um, that's the science arbiter. The third category is what I call the issue advocate. Um, 
politics is full of issue advocates. Not all of them, of course, are experts. Um, but the goal of the issue advocate is to reduce the scope of choice that a decision maker has, usually to a, a single outcome. Um, we'd like a carbon tax put in place. We'd like to limit GMOs. Um, we'd like a certain official elected. Um, advocacy is, 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 is throughout politics. Um, and it's an, an important and a noble part of democratic processes. Um, but when it comes to policy action, it's not the only role. Um, so the fourth category is the honest broker. Um, and the honest broker you can think of uh, at the other end of the spectrum from the, the issue advocate. Um, the honest broker seeks to clarify possibilities, um, to give the decision maker an understanding of what their choice is um, in making a decision. So the honest broker is not about compelling a particular choice, it's about empowering um, the decision maker to understand the scope of choice. They're very different roles, and uh, the, the book is called The Honest Broker because that's what I think is the most difficult role for experts to play. Um, and then the last category is what I call the stealth issue advocate. Um, a lot of times in interactions between experts and decision makers, there's a tendency for experts to, uh, to say, well, I'm just focused on facts. I don't care what you do. It's, uh, I'm value free. Um, but really, the expert wants the decision maker to actually do a particular thing, um, to, to take a particular action. Um, for those who are engaged in this topic, um, it's very closely related to what's called the deficit model of science. That if, if only we experts gave decision makers knowledge, they'd make the right decision, which is the same decision I would make. Um, it's problematic, doesn't work very well. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, I think the political context of a particular decision is very important for understanding what roles may or may not be appropriate. Um, and let me say of the, of the four roles, not including the stealth issue advocate, which is problematic, um, all of them are important and uh, scientists are needed in, in all of those roles at different times. Um, but the degree of scientific uncertainty is an important factor. Um, and also the degree of values agreement within society. Um, if a topic is highly politically contested, um, it's very difficult uh, for experts to come in and simply report the facts. Um, it may be more productive to engage in policy options, for example. Um, I'll leave it there, and I would be happy to uh, expand or discuss or put it into particular context. Um, as we heard from Mark and Pearl, um, the practical world when you get into bureaucracies that involve political settings, um, these roles become blurred and difficult, um, but hopefully they provide a, somewhat of a framework to discuss um, what we think we're doing, at least, when we are engaging with, with decision makers. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, now we will start a debate. I, rem I remind to the public if that, that they can post their questions on, uh, on the, um, let's say, on the panel, on the chat, the chat space that is at the right of the video, of the video interface you are using. So if you post your questions there, uh, uh, a moderator will forward them to me and I will be able to put them to the speakers. In fact, we already have two questions, but there is one more, uh, one that I have myself. In fact, I have a lot, but uh, I will not uh, take too much time with my questions. Um, I was wondering, I mean, the question is for, um, uh, it's for Roger. I was wondering whether you have examples, specific examples of cases. I'm thinking maybe in previous conversation we talked about climate change, fluorination of water, vaccines, etc., in which these different models that you have talked about have been applied and what the results have been. Maybe if you could give us, let's say, one, a positive and a negative one or, a, or, or two different ones somehow. Examples, I mean. Yeah, um, there, there's a vast amount of experience um, actually um, in the real world using and applying these models, even though they're not often, you know, this jargon isn't often used. Um, so, for example, um, national academies like the Royal Society in the UK or the uh, National Academy of Sciences in the US um, often engage in, in what I call science arbitration. They're called upon to, to answer questions. Um, on, on any number of topics, hundreds of topics. Um, government advisory committees often play this role. Um, issue advocacy we see all the time. Scientists are joining up with uh, 
interest groups to uh, lobby government. Uh, sometimes this is for, for science itself, for more science funding. Um, sometimes it's for funding in their own area. Other times it's for policy action um, on particular topics to, um, to restrict nuclear power, to, to ban GMOs or to promote GMOs. Um, plenty of advocates. And in fact, I think um, the most common relation that experts and scientists have with decision makers is in the form of advocacy. Um, and I think sometimes there's a little too much advocacy um, from the scientific community. Um, and an example honest, of honest brokering? Yeah, honest brokering um, is more difficult because there's not really a constituency. Um, often policymakers, uh, elected officials in particular, think of experts and scientists as providing cover for a particular decision they want to make. And if a um, expert says, well, you could do A, B, C, or D, um, it really puts the, the onus of decision making <laughs> onto the decision maker. Um, it doesn't provide cover. Uh, for the scientists, the scientists may really think they have a particular option that's important. So there's not a lot of incentive in the scientific community for a, a scientist to say, well, you could mitigate climate change or you could just burn all the carbon and everything in between. Um, there's, there's not a, uh, uh, it takes a, a lot of leadership to step back and say, here's what your options are. That said, um, there are institutions um, like the National Research Council in the United States. Um, there are examples that I, I cite often like the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. Um, you just heard Pearl talking about what they call an opinion in which they give recommendations, which would provide a, a perfect forum for providing a suite of recommendations. Um, in the United States, there was an organization called the Office of Technology Assessment, um, which famously was an honest broker organization, um, and which unfortunately was terminated because it didn't make specific recommendations, it gave options. Um, and with respect to stealth issue advocacy, Anytime you hear an expert say, you know, I'm just focused on the facts or the facts tell it, the science tells us we must do A, B, or C, you have a pretty good indication that uh, they're using science as, uh, as, as a bit of a, a Trojan horse to get into political arguments. Okay, thanks. And then I had a question for the other two speakers, for both of them, in fact. Um, I, I, I understand that, I mean, I think that a crucial issue in your job is basically protecting your independence. Is there, I mean, both from external um, pressures, but also I, I guess from ideological biases or whatever may come even from, or, or, or disciplinary biases based on your education, et cetera. Is there, I mean, how do you um, handle this issue? How do you practically handle the, the the fact that, I mean, the, the, how do you build the trust in the fact that you are really acting independently? I mean, it's a big question, so I know, a question I know, but uh, maybe you have a couple of ideas to spare for us. So whoever wants, Mark or Bert. Okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll kick off, is, is that okay? So, yeah, so, I, so I think um, independence um, is important. But in the political system, trust is also important. And what do I mean by trust? I mean, if the science advice, I like to break it down into formal and informal. So the kind of formal are the reports and so on, which you've spoken about. And that's fairly objective. That's a group of people who by any normal criteria would be independent. And what that means is that they've declared any kind of conflicts of interest, either real or perceived. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't have those conflicts of interest. I mean, for example, somebody may own 20 shares or something in a pharmaceutical company on a report that relates to the pharmaceutical industry. I wouldn't call that a conflict of interest, but I would say it, you have to be transparent because it could be uh, perceived in that way. So, so transparency, I think there are fairly good uh, uh, rules that sit around that, which is really about making it clear what anybody could interpret as a conflict or not. And then when they read the report, you can either take that into account or not, depending on, on what you want to do. So for the formal stuff, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward how you assemble such people and how you get that transparency. For the informal uh, uh, mm -hmm. advice, I mean, it's very, very important, in my opinion, that a policymaker or a, a politician or whomever can speak, uh, for example, to myself um, and, not, and know that information is not going to go 
anywhere else, and more importantly, that it's not going to be used against them. Because it's only then that you can engage in a very early, you know, I'm thinking about doing this kind of conversation, or, or what do you think about that? And I am always at great pains when I have those kind of conversations, and they're very important conversations, to say, look, I'm not going to give you any personal advice. I'm not an expert, except in a very narrow field. And even then, that's only you know, my view on that particular topic. But what I can do is I can point you to where there is an objective assessment. I can refer you to a, a group of people internationally who are of high standing in this area and who would be regarded as you know, thought leaders. And, and if you're going to do that in any kind of a controversial area, it's always good to be able to pick, pick people who would independently have a different view so that people can do that. And I think many, many policymakers and many politicians are used uh, having uh, uh, people advocate all the time. In fact, when I speak with government ministers, almost everybody coming through the door is advocating for something, whether it's more funding for housing or roads or health or science or whatever it is, whether it's somebody wanting some local issue sorted out or some ideology. I mean, it's an advocacy kind of uh, environment. And so being able to, to point uh, to places where you can see where there's a clear uh, consensus of opinion, where you can see that there are things that are undecided and so on is important. Um, but it's also very, very important to have that one-on-one -on -one uh, relationship and that actually can never be transparent so so if you think about the formal piece I said how you would have these conflicts of interest and so on if you're to gain the trust of uh, someone then you know you can't have a transparent situation where something that is completely wacky or or a silly <laughs> idea or something that would go against somebody's uh, perceived ideology could be in the public domain I mean that just simply does not work so, so there has to be a degree of trust in the system uh, for the informal piece. Okay, Pearl, your turn, and then we already have four questions, so we will... Okay, I'll try back. not to repeat what Mark has said, because our role within the high-level group is very similar to what, to what he is emphasizing. Um, conflict of interest, we're very, very open about this. Um, we have a roster and it says exactly what kind of, whatever we are engaged in. Transparency, I alluded to that earlier. Um, it's very clear what we're basing our views on, where we have read them. The website, people can read um, the communications we have, uh, the emails we have, so everything we do can be monitored, can be checked. And another is that we emphasize that our work is to provide advice to policymakers. So we're doing science for policy. And what we're very strongly refraining from is policy for science. I know that when I first started that people approached me and they would say, oh, can you get such and such a topic on the H2020 agenda? I said, no. We, and we all say this, we are not in there to promote or to use Roger's term to be advocates for, okay, more money has to go to, I mean, that's what we do on a daily basis, but as our role as high level group is we stay away from engaging in policy for science. We are using and we are drawing upon scientific knowledge to help policy makers to give them the options and to help them or we make sense of science so that they can make better informed decisions and we do this indeed trust is essential and transparency is essential but those are two words that came through in Mark's talk as well. Okay so let's start with the floors question the first one by Scott refers to a consultation uh, to grassroots organizations and other organizations that is called Future of Europe. Maybe you are aware of it. So the question by Scott is how we can make science count in informing this uh, popular consultation. Anybody of you who is aware of it or may want to comment on this? I am, I'll jump in. Um, I'm not Please. exactly sure. I mean, there are very, very, very many um, citizen groups in Europe 
Um, I'm not, I, I must be honest, I'm not aware of the future of Europe. Mm -hmm. What we have done in our work, and then I'm talking about cybersecurity, I'm talking about the new breeding techniques, I'm talking about CO2 core emissions, is that we have gone through great efforts um, at various stages where people, and, and Brussels does that more generally, where if a particular topic is being dealt with, then people can provide input for that topic. So that's one form of citizen engagement. We also do it in our stakeholder meetings where we've already uh, drafted the report, but then present our results to it's, stakeholders. It's an awful word, but these might be citizen groups. They might be, um, as I said, industrialists. So we, find it very very important to engage and with representatives of citizen groups um okay. i myself have worked on what's called citizens for science or science for citizens and i do believe that to maintain trust um to know what are important issues with which people are engaged that such kind of a negotiation, open exchange of ideas is absolutely essential. Okay, second question by Petros to Mark. So the question, I, I would read it literally. Mark, how a research project that will have a small contribution to knowledge can actually make an impact to the society? Do we really need a different approach in funding opportunities? Which one? Okay, so I mean that's a very interesting question. There are many people who want to do research uh, where they would like their findings to uh, to influence some kind of public policy, and I think engagement is a key word here. So uh, in our science assessment, if people have that as a kind of impact, there are some very simple questions you could ask, and, and they're very similar to the questions you would ask of an industrial policy. First of all, have you ever talked to the policymaker? Do you even know the, the person's name or department in that country? Have you met with them? Have you asked them what's important to them as opposed to what's important to you? Um, and, uh, and I mean, those are kind of basic questions. And by the way, they're completely analogous to if you want to have an economic impact, you know, you should know the company that might be interested and you should ask them what they're interested in, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a very uh, uh, a basic uh, piece there. And I can just say when we assess it, I mean, that's how we assess the, the um, potential impact of, uh, of what you're doing. Because if you haven't done any of those things, I would suggest you're very unlikely to have any impact. Um, doesn't mean you won't, but what you're relying on is that somebody somewhere is going to randomly read your contribution to something. And, it, and I mean, there's a lot of coincidences in that. Um, the other thing I would say is you learn a lot from that. So, uh, uh, you know, I used to be in, in my past life uh, uh, in a company as well as in academia. And, you know, lots and lots of academics came to see me. And I would say for every thousand people who came to see me, 999 told me what they thought I should be interested in, which was normally what they were interested in. And only, and only one person ever said, what are you interested in? And if you sort of start with that question, actually you can then think about where your expertise or your bias may actually, and, and sometimes you can even lead the person to where you want to be by going through a channel of something that is important to them. And most policymakers, like most people in industry, have a kind of urgent agenda like um, if they say I'm really interested in this and I need to know it by next month, then then the kind of answer that says, well, you know, for a hundred thousand uh, euros and ten years of research, I can answer your question. It's not a helpful kind of, of response. So so there's a degree of pragmatism between sorting out what's a short term, a medium term, and a long term. But most funders would be very very interested in funding uh, uh, research proposals that addressed really important uh, policy issues for people. Um, I mean, that's high on everybody's agenda. Okay, the next question by Georgiana uh, refers to the bridge between the European Commission and, or, or, or better, the gap and the missing bridge, according to her, in her opinion, between the European Commission as co and scholars on the field. For example, she asked, how could one work for the European Commission as a migration scholar 
particularly particularly in crisis areas like Turkey. Uh, she's, I understand she's referring to how to bridge this gap between experts on the field and the European Commission. What are the ways, the possible bridges, if any? Is the word breaches or bridges? Bridges, like, you know, bridge, bridging okay. the gap. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think it's absolutely essential for scientists, um, whether they are, like, even students are scientists, or whether they are at very senior levels, to have their foot in, if I'm talking about social sciences, in the actual issues. Um, we have to be careful to remain scientists and not become journalists. Um, because we still have our theoretical background or we're contributing to theory. But to work as a scientist in a migration camp in Lesbos, for example, that can feed you with information or provide you with a perspective that you might not get from just reading papers. So I would say engage in this kind of work and use it to infuse your academic interest. Okay, and, and do you think there are any formal ways for the scholars to convey somehow their opinion or their point of view to the oh, commission? There's a myriad of ways to do this. Again, um, that's the nice part about Brussels, is that there are so many interest groups in Brussels. One thing that I, now I'm going to sit on my scientist and my professor chair, and, and Mark was doing it a little bit too. It requires time and effort to engage with policymakers. You have to build a rapport. You have to know what they are interested in. You have to know when and how you might help them. And to do this, the nice thing about Europe is that they're all kind of organizations that will help you do this. I'm trying to think of the centers of excellence in the UK that organize meetings between scientists and policymakers in Brussels, but they also do it um, in various countries. So it's important as an individual scientist to keep an eye out on such meetings and yes, to participate. You will learn um, to take on the perspective of a, pol uh, a policy maker. You will see um, when to present your evidence because if what you're presenting is not on the agenda of a policy maker, you will not be as effective as when it is on the agenda. And another role you can play is to describe what you are doing and to perhaps suggest that it might be an issue that the policymakers might want to take up in the future without stuffing it down their throats. It is a delicate balance. But the engagement with policymakers requires time and effort, mm -hmm. and it's investment that we have to make. And increasingly, our universities are enabling this kind of investment because they see that science can make a difference, particularly if we're engaged in the kinds of work where we're examining the effectiveness of particular intervention. So I would so, say keep up this kind of work. Okay, so the following question by Pai Tamon, how do science advisors act when the policymakers decide to, to ignore what science clearly advises? So maybe Roger, since you're based in the US, this sounds like something, this resonates with something that may be happening in the US. So what do you do when, uh, when policymakers ignore uh, scientific evidence, let's say? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is a complicated issue because it involves uh, a lot of presuppositions. So let's, let's unpack it a little bit. Um, sometimes scientists are recommending courses of action. And if, uh, a policymaker in a democracy chooses to ignore that recommendation. Um, I guess one one reality is that's how democracies work, and scientists aren't in charge. Um, 
there's another situation which I think is, it is truly more problematic is in situations when policymakers ignore evidence or um, make decisions based on flawed evidence. And this is where it's really, really important for uh, governments, um, but also for scientific institutions to have very strong organizations that can uh, provide evidence uh, in a way. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, is an example of an attempt to bring together scientists to say, here's what we know um, in, in the best possible way um, to inform decision making. Um, if, if an assessment process is done well, you'll find that um, many people are unhappy with it uh, because it doesn't reflect the views of any single scientist or any single interest group, uh, nor does it reflect the political positions of any particular policymaker. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be difficult. Now, we're in a situation now where um, people, and I think we see this more and more in Europe, but we certainly see it in the United States, where people will quickly yell fake news to any mm. sort of information that they don't like or don't appreciate. Um, and it takes very strong institutions and strong scientific leadership to be able to say, this is what the science says. Um, and that's a very different question than saying, this is what a parliament should do, or this is what a government should do. Um, so I, I think the, the idea that science renders verdicts and politicians act, um, if you think about that in a, as a linear process, it's an, an oversimplification of how the real world actually works. Okay, so once again, I understand you are insisting in that the role of an honest broker is not providing course of actions, but rather options based on evidence somehow. Yeah, certainly that's the role of the honest broker. But even if you're an issue advocate, um, hmm. uh, I, I mean, we, we all, all of us in the, in the scientific community would love to see more money for science. Um, and a lot of times scientific organizations make that recommendation. And very rarely do governments give scientists all the money that they wish for or ask for. Um, but that's not a rejection of science or a rejection of advice. That's simply uh, the reality that governments reflect a, a diverse citizenry with a lot of different values, a lot of different demands. And uh, the advice for more funding for science is balanced off with advice for more money for education, for defense, uh, for health, uh, for social programs. Um, and that's that's the the messiness of democratic systems. Okay, I think it's also I think it's also important for the scientific yeah. community to understand that evidence is only one of the facets that a policymaker may take into account when making policy. I mean, there's history, geography, culture, religion, and then there are all things like bias, uh, getting elected again. You know. Uh, 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 what your own personal idiosyncrasies may be. And, and we have a tendency in science to believe that evidence trumps everything else. Um, that's, not, that's not necessarily the case. You know, through the eyes of a politician, I would suggest perhaps getting elected again might trump everything else. And, and there will be people who will have a strong cultural or historical bias. So, you know, the question was, what do you do when the evidence is ignored? I think... Um, what I always say is that, that uh, we failed in the scientific community to present that evidence in a way in which it would be acceptable. So instead of trying to blame others, I think we have to blame ourselves. And in order to then address that, you have to understand the context in which that decision was made. Was it made in the context of history or religion or, or a popular movement or, or what have you? Or was it because actually the evidence was muddled and not particularly well presented or, or you know, whatever? I mean, there can be mistakes on, on the science side. So I think every time uh, that evidence is ignored, you have to ask the question why. And there may be very good reasons that it was ignored because it was, other considerations were thought to be more important. And then we need to understand that. And if appropriate, we need to work on that or respect it, actually, because you can make decisions on other things. And then we also need to understand where we have actually messed up and not actually presented it in a coherent or palatable or uh, sensible way. There is a tendency on the scientific community to say, if only everybody understood, the world would be perfect. <laughs> and, and actually, I don't go along with that. I actually think that you know we're as flawed as anybody else, and we can present things uh, badly. We don't do it deliberately. Nobody else does. And I think we also need to respect that there will be decisions that will be made 
that are, that are not supported for the evidence, but that are made for good reason. And that's why politicians are elected as politicians to weigh up those societal, religious, cultural, historical, whatever other biases uh, that are in there together with, with the evidence. And that's part of the political system. I mean, evidence doesn't <laughs> have something else. It's not, it's not an ace of spades. And maybe here, I mean, I have a comment or question myself. I mean, now on this side, let's say, of the Atlantic in the UK, we have heard high-ranking politicians saying we have had enough of experts, we are fed up with experts, etc. Isn't there a matter here of a sudden and unexpected distrust in science or disbelief in science or um, for some reason some something that was considered prestigious until now, uh, scientific evidence suddenly has become something that is annoying? Or no. is that no, a I mean, of politician that is manipulating? I mean. No, I think that um, we also need to understand how the world has changed. And I mean, science has become very democratized. So if you think about it, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, you couldn't get access to the information. You know, you had to be a scholar. The information was in a library, in a learned journal, or a book that you didn't subscribe to, and perhaps you didn't understand the language of, and so on. So that that was restricted to a small domain of of, of people who were then trusted to pontificate and come up with uh, with a series of advice. But the world has changed. I mean, science is very democratized. You can find out almost everything you want to find out on the internet. Or, or by reading various pieces of information. And I think society has changed. I mean, I think people want to discover things for themselves um, uh, as opposed to being told what they should think. And, and we need to respond to that in the scientific advice community. And the best example I have of that comes, uh, the, or the, let's say the best example I know of, comes from the UK where uh, the now deceased uh, 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 chief scientific advisor to the UK Department of Energy, as it was in its previous incarnation, produced an energy calculator for the UK. And what this did was it told you what the demands of energy for the UK were for households and, and uh, uh, businesses and so on in different regions. And then it told you how much energy you could generate from wind farms, from uh, you know ocean devices, from burning oil, from burning coal, from nuclear reactors and so on. And then it, and then it provided based on this very rich, uh, uh, strong evidence, I mean, you know, how much uh, uh, energy you generate out of uh, so much oil or coal, it said, you go ahead and decide what the energy mix should be for the UK, how many nuclear reactors, how many coal reactors, how many uh, oil-based things and so on. And here are the consequences of that, either in terms of CO2 emission or whatever. And, you know, if you want everything from wind, I think the calculation is there's a, there's a turbine every yard of the land and probably, you know, a couple of miles out into the sea. And what that does when people discover it for themselves is it allows people to get away from a polarized position, which may say no nuclear or no fossil fuels, or because you suddenly find you can't balance the equation. And that's a much more powerful um, uh, way of engagement than somebody saying, I am telling you, we cannot balance the equation without filling the name of the blank coal or nuclear or whatever. So we have to learn, I think, in the science community that, um, that engagement doesn't mean telling people what the correct answer is and hoping that they will think that. That engagement also uh, is about providing people with the correct factual base. That's very important. You know, you can get a lot of garbage out of the internet as well as a lot of very useful stuff. So what is the appropriate factual base? Well, and, and the way you go and, and, and you decide based on that information what you think the correct conclusion could be. So, so I yes, think okay. we have a lot to learn. Yeah, the energy calculator is certainly a very nice example to keep in mind when one thinks about this subject. Next question by Thomas. Uh, uh, again, about, let's say, bridging the gap between civil society and, and the European Commission. So uh, he asks about the NGO or civil society organization that have to do with the research and development concern, what is their uh, role in the SAM, in the, in the science advisory mechanism? SAM is the name of the mm -hmm. official name of this mechanism of the European Union. Is there a place for NGOs and civil society organization or is it restricted only to academies? Um, the formal, formally, there's no place. 
The formal setup is there's a high level group of the seven scientists, there's a secretariat. The secretariat are people who are employed by the European Commission. And then there's this association of universities again, or association of academies. Um, and these are individual scientists, but scientists do not operate. Well, some of them do, but not many do not operate in this only scientific world. So the role is um, in providing, uh, in communicating with a national academy or in communicating with um, the European Commission or in participating in the public events that we as SAM um, organize or that the JRC, the Joint Research Centers, um, in Brussels organize. Um, so no, there's no formal role, but there's ample opportunity for informal engagement. And to get to know that, um, again, as I was saying, there are lots of organizations who will help you do it. It's go to the internet, find out the organizations, find out the organizations that serve your interests, and they will have developed ways of uh, finding their way to the scientific community. And we represent the scientific community in Brussels. Great, so an, a question by Evi. Uh, she's interested in uh, starting up in the field. So she says, um, uh, obviously, I mean, the, the question is uh, how to start when wanting to make a contribution, but you are on the first steps of your career. Of course, you cannot advise when you don't have the necessary experience, but are there teams or project, projects, for example, that offer the opportunity to learn and gain essential skills? Do you have any suggestion for, let's say, budding scientific advisor? Um, who's going to do it? Go ahead. Whoever has ideas. <laughs> oh, I have ideas. I think mm -hmm. it's, I mean, the fact that this question is being asked is wonderful. Because I think um, for social scientists or for scientists to realize that they also have a public role is crucial. And that's the very first step. I think um, one is stick with your scientific methodology. Stick with approaching issues from scientific point of view. But... Be very critical about the kind of department you look for. There are definite differences across Europe in how, um, how better engaged particular academic departments are with the public and whether the public is the policy makers or whether it's the broader group of citizens. But I think um, I would say do it. Find examples and try and get to work with the people who you think are doing a good job. But I'd say go for it. Okay. Any other remark or suggestion on how to get started in the field? Of yeah, I would jump in and say that um, you know I hear from a lot of students who say I would like to make a difference, which is great. Um, but it, on the one hand, you have to recognize that it's it's more than just having good intent. Um, if I said all of a sudden, you know, I'd like to become a condensed matter physicist, um, I'd have to take some training and understand how that field actually works. Um, so there is uh, a need to understand, you know, what is what is this whole thing about advice and decision making and policy and politics? Um, and the other is to get involved in the system. There's plenty of opportunities. Um, you know, Pearl mentioned the Joint Research Center, which is actually a, a huge organization of uh, scientists and other experts who provide support to the European Commission. Um, get an internship, get a job, um, go work for government, go work for as a staff member in parliament. Um, come back to science, of course, but there's nothing like walking in the shoes of decision makers, um, sitting with them in the room, watching them actually struggle with making decisions. Um, to get a better understanding of how the process works. Um, and ultimately, um, I would suggest be humble because policymaking is hard and we don't often give uh, policymakers or their advisors enough credit for the, the hard and difficult work that they do. Um, and if, if we experts understood that better, we'd be in a much better position to offer them consistent support over time.
Okay, we need to uh, finish short briefly, but there are already, I think, two or three questions. One is against about funds. So, for example, fields like uh, environmental, uh, sorry, like uh, natural disaster, disasters, which, uh, um, okay, so I read you the question. The decision making is always affected by the available funding, for example, in natural disasters. How can we increase the quality of the decision considering limited funding? So they are asking about, yeah, about, um, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, uh, the connection between uh, good scientific advice and uh, underfunding of certain areas. So I can be very quick in an answer to that. I mean, yes, scientific yes. advice in the case of a, a, an emergency or a catastrophe, I mean, there's a very small short list of questions that, that anybody can ask themselves, you know, what are the key things we need to know, which isn't everything you need to know, it's what are the key things to know, you know, what do we currently know, what's missing, how much is it going to cost to get knowledge of, uh, of what it is that we don't know, when are we going to be able to do that, even if we could fund it? And when you run, you know, the, the uh, things across a metric of questions like the ones I've just articulated, a lot of stuff falls away because if you need to make a response in the next 24 hours and it's going to cost you 5 million euros in 10 years to get the answer, then actually we don't need to consider that. We have to make a decision without that evidence. So, so you can very quickly hone down in an emergency or in a, in a natural disaster area. And that's one of the reasons why a linkage, for example, of groups of uh, chief scientific advisors and advisory mechanisms, such as Sir Peter Gluckman has put together and you see in the European Commission, is really very helpful because people can very quickly uh, you know, network. It's a Henry Kissinger question. You know, if I want to call Europe, who do I call? Well, in the case of a, of a, um, a, a chief scientific advice, you know, supposing we have a problem, then I know a network of people and I can lift the phone or send an email and say, look, you know, we've got a peat fire or something. Anybody ever dealt with one of those before? Have you got some advice or whatever it may be? So those networks, I think, are very important. But the most important thing in a, in a critical or emergency situation is to distill out the core, really important information you need to know and, and to distill out of that what is doable in the time frame uh, and with the funding available. And, and I suggest that in most cases, the time frame trumps almost everything else. You really need to do something before you can actually marshal all of the stuff that you want. And a related, and a related question, question by Jamaica or Pearl. Mm -hmm. uh, Dijkstra said that uh, the high-level group does not policy for science, but wouldn't it make sense to highlight areas where <laughs> science quality could improve? <laughs> um, indirectly, we do that when we say um, this issue has not been dealt with. Um, or there's disagreement among scientists, or it's an issue that's so new, scientists haven't been looking at that. So indirectly, we sometimes will say, or you can read it in the report, because there's an absence of solid evidence, or the evidence is messy, um, or the science is so new, that it yes, still needs to be developed. So indirectly, there's those kinds of messages. But what I, the point I was trying to make is we will not go out and then say, OK, European Commission, please you know, reserve so many millions of euros for such and such a topic. Um, okay. But we do provide um, an overview of the state of art of particular areas in science. So I will put you the last question by Owen, and I ask you really to give just a quick idea, each one of you, but it's a very broad one. Why scientists increase, uh, with scientists increasingly perceived by some in societies as elitist and unrepresentative, how can we strengthen the legitimacy, legitimacy of the contribution of scientists to policymaking? Really quickly, because we are over time. My quick answer, better engagement with the public. We need to engage, 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 uh, and uh, that's my quick answer. Great. My quick answer is 
get it's the engagement um and it's also i, I forgot what i was going to say um roger first then i'll come back i'm sorry no yeah problem. i think it's important to recognize uh two things one is that um both in the europe and in the united states uh science uh and scientists have very high standing and they have for a long time it doesn't always have to be that way um, but it, that's how it has and it would do this expert community well to pay attention to what's going on in politics um, and the effects, say, of technological change on jobs um, and changing people's patterns of life and their uncertainties um, and economics and all of the issues that people care about. Um, and if you don't want to be perceived as an elitist, um, don't act like an elitist, I guess, would be the, the, the final thing I'd say. Yeah. I can remember now what I wanted to say, and that is the fact that citizens are looking at us is good for science because we have to come out and we have to say why we why science is important so i think it's very good to have outsiders looking at our work and criticizing us okay great thanks a lot i, rem I remind you that the video will be available later on youtube very in very short time and that our next seminar will be about uh let's say buzzword but that represents a big big movement in science which is open science and we will uh announce soon the the time and uh, end date thanks to everybody and bye bye thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank you